I'm Trudy Kerr and welcome to The Interviewer. In this series, I talk to artists, campaigners, men and women of influence, musicians, performers, sportsmen and women, politicians, businessmen and women, and anyone who shapes the fabric of our society. Karen Schranz is a psychotherapist, a fitness trainer, and also a group coach on the Six Pack Revolution. Karen holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and two master's degrees, an MSc in Gesalt Psychotherapy and an MSc in Human Resource Management and Training. She's a practicing psychotherapist and Karen has developed and run workshops on eating disorders and obesity and worked with a number of clients with eating disorders. She has facilitated seminars for psychology students at university covering topics such as life skills, personal development and sexuality. Karen has also spoken out about fertility, adoption and her own experiences. But as I said before, Karen is also familiar to a lot of people on the island as the face of Six Pack Revolution in Malta, the brainchild of an old neighbour of mine, Scott Harrison, a programme of diet and exercise that transforms lives. And as a 53-year-old woman who looks half her age, Karen it really is a testimony to how a healthy lifestyle can make a real difference. Karen! Thank you so much for being Thank on the interview. It's, it's an, such an honor to be here. Oh, well, it's an absolute pleasure. And I've been thinking about this for a really, really long time. But here's the problem. There's so many things in your introduction uh, that I'd like to touch on. And I feel like we could be here for days. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to tell your own story. I gave you an introduction and said a little bit about your background, but I'm going to ask you just to share your own story. And as we do that, we'll pick out some of the key points that are really important. So how did you get to where you are today? Uh, how far back shall I go? <laughs> you can start right at the very beginning. I've, I've always loved sports and fitness, so that is what, it's probably one of the only things I excelled at at school, because that's the only thing that I looked forward to. But growing up, I always felt when I grow up, I'm going to be a mummy. So I never really thought about career or anything like that, because all I ever wanted to be was get married, a traditional kind of wife in those days, and mother, family, uh, a traditional kind of family. And um, so we started trying to have kids as soon as I got married. And so I didn't have a fallback plan because I thought, OK, I'm going to be a mummy. But so how old were you when you got married? Though? 26. OK, so you were fairly young. So you hadn't sort of gone down the whole I'd career I'd gone to path. university, but okay. it was just something I wanted to do, obviously, um, further my education and everything. But my plan was to get married and have babies. And many of them. <laughs> but um, anyway, so we got married and we started trying to have kids. It didn't happen. It didn't happen for 10 years. I mean, we tried and we did so much in that time, so many treatments. And But obviously, in 10 years, I, I was like, OK, I had to take a new look at my life and say, OK, what am I going to do if plan A is not working? So I needed to find a plan B. And I loved um, psychology. We have a family business, but I was never tempted to go into that. I'm not really business minded. I love working with people and I love um, the emotional side of life rather than the business side of life. And so um, I said, OK, I can't. No, I don't want my life to be unhappy because I haven't got kids. I want to be happy despite the pain or find you know, a purpose despite my pain. And um, I studied psychotherapy, which helped heal me and my pain. And also, you know, I had something to do and I love what I do. And um, after 10 years of trying to have kids, we adopted two kids from Russia. They were eight and six years old when they came to Malta, their brother and sister, and Oxy and Nikki. And, um, and then I was really fulfilled as a mother, too. But my husband, after like three years, my husband's like, let's try IVF one more time. And I was like, I can't, I can't. I've closed that chapter. I've healed the pain. I've accepted. I've got closure and I can't reopen that. And how old were you at that point? We were, uh, when we adopted, um, I was 36. 
And um, when David started telling me, let's try and have another baby, I was about 40, 40 39, 40. And so I this isn't at an early age anyways. This no. is a bit of a shock. For sure. And I was like, there's no way I can do this. I don't have the courage. And the only thing, the only thing that gives you courage is hope. And I had lost hope after we had done nine IVFs. So I couldn't deal with the disappointment again and the pain. And I had no hope. So I was like, there's no way I can reopen that. I've healed it. And every time we talked about it, I seriously just did this. Because I used to get so anxious and panic and feel that my head swimming with anxiety. And he's like, please, let's do it. And anyway, then he came, my mother, and he came on the same day with this article that they saw in the newspaper, some English newspaper, of a story of a lady similar to me, unexplained infertility, 40 years of age, multiple failed IVFs, and she did this new treatment that helped her have a baby. And that gave me hope. So the hope gave me the courage to try again. So what was the treatment, if you don't mind me asking? Um, it was some kind of selection of, some kind of selection pre-fertilization to the egg. Some kind of treatment pre-fertilization okay. to the egg. But when we got to the clinic in, in England, um, the doctor was like, there's no such thing as unexplained infertility. You just haven't found why you're not getting pregnant. But, uh, well, hang on a second. Hang on, Karen. I hear a lot of women being told they have unexplained infertility. And I always used to say, I've got unexplained infertility. Everything seems okay. Everything works, but I'm not getting pregnant. And um, he said, there's no such thing as unexplained. It is, you just haven't found the problem. There is a problem, it's just not very evident. You know what it is, it's hard to find. And he said, and it normally lies within the immune system when it's unexplained, because the immune system is so complex and there's so many factors can, that can affect pregnancy. So he said, I will do the treatment that you read about, but I'd also like you to take this blood test. It's an immune system test. And I was like, I've done them all, forget it, there's nothing. And he's like, this is a new test and it's only available in the US. I have to send your blood to Chicago, this one particular lab. So we did it and we found the problem. Um, basically, a very technical story, but I'll say it as easily as possible. If I needed a, a, an organ, David is a perfect match for me because I don't recognize him as a foreign body. Okay. So when you create an embryo, the body, your immune system recognizes it as a foreign body because it's half a man. Okay. Um, and it creates what's called a blocker around this embryo. And um, so when it goes down into the uterus, this is at fertilization point, it's still in fallopian tubes. When it goes down into the uterus, the immune system there is even stronger and it's protected against the immune system and it can Im embed. I'm not recognizing David as a foreign body. There's something in my blood, some protein. I give you the name if you like, HLADQ alpha. That's not Thank true. <laughs> <laughs> That's not There's not a test at the end of this, is no, there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. I'll ask you at the end. What was the protein's name? And anyway, and that was it. And um, I just had to take blood serum for, from another man for three months in a row. And um, basically, it was injected under the skin to create a severe allergic reaction to me. I had welts here and welts here, and I couldn't put anything on them. They were like stings, like huge mountains. And the more, the bigger, the better, because it was me it meant my immune system was really reacting. And um, then I, I could have tried naturally, but I was 41 by then, and um, I didn't want to take any risks. So we went ahead with the IVF. They. I had only three eggs, and they said, selected the healthy egg because two of them were not normal, genetically normal, common to a 41-year-old. And, um, and anyway, it, it fertilized, and I was told less than 6% chance of getting pregnant because of your age. It's not even a good quality embryo. And 10 days later, I took a pregnancy test because I couldn't wait. I was just so excited, and I was pregnant. And... My mom was like, don't tell anyone. But I was like, 
I've waited so long to... to so this was, I mean, this is beyond 10 years. This would be... It's 15 years later. 15. And then I had Lily, who's a bit spoiled. She's 10 now. <laughs> but for the first two years, I just could not put her down. I held her like... This is a child you had waited for for 15 years. And at one point, you'd given up hope completely that this would ever happen. Now, I, I mean... We have a whole other Karen story that we need to explore, okay. but let's stay with this just for the minute because I'm I'm fairly sure there are a lot of women and couples and men who can identify with this. Just, mm -hmm. just to recap this for a second, you've tried for 10 years, you've tried absolutely everything, every IVF, every fertility treatment, and you Immune. were told uh -huh. you have an unexplained uh, issue with fertility. And unexplained, I've heard people say this before, mm -hmm. just means they don't know what the explanation exactly. is. You went on to have uh, two beautiful children through Grown adoption. Grown-ups now. Grown-ups now. <laughs> 25 and 23. Good grief. <laughs> wow. So real grown-ups yes. now. So two, two beautiful kids through adoption. Then your, it was your husband that said, let's give it one more go. And you come across this article. Lily's thanks to him. <gasps> yeah, you come and you go to the, to the UK. Now, you talked about this treatment. It sounded morose. It sounded I awful. think out of everything I had done, like all the treatments, all the tests, all the investigations, all the moments I've been in clinics, like kind of explored and whatever, this was the, the worst. It was the most painful. Because it was so itchy and burned. It was like bee stings, but that you couldn't um, calm down with anything because they were... And this was just to aggravate the immune system enough... To, kick, to, to make my immune system super sensitive, so sensitive that it recognises David as a foreign body. Because and it wasn't. This is, I mean, just... Uh, this is incredible because obviously technology now enabled or not even, 10 years ago, enabled doctors or this particular doctor and this particular um, blood uh, uh, testing situation to be able to identify what the problem is. But infertility affects one in four couples. One in four couples within Europe. One in four. This is a huge number. And of course, I should imagine there's an awful lot of people within that percentage that have the same issue that are, are told it's unexplained infertility and and it wouldn't have if mattered. you can if you have the courage if you have um even sometimes the financial ability keep digging you know it's not if you really want it i mean no that sounds bad because everyone really wants it if you can keep going keep going because today there is a technology to help most couples have their longs for baby was there any point, once you started this second phase, this, this new, your husband has said, let's try again, was there any point where you were just like, this is not going to happen, I, I'm, I found my peace, I'm sorry, but just know I'm walking away from this? When he kept trying, when he was asking me, let's do it, yes, for, for a long time, till, till the hope was reignited with that article, I still have the article, it was about this, guy, this surgeon in his suit holding a baby and, and the story. I still have the article that gave me that little bit of hope to try one more time. And I mean, when I was approaching 40, I was like, this is it, you know, it's over. There's no hope now, but you can never say no or never or no hope, you know. Well, well your story is, is one that I hope gives hope to a lot of people because obviously you know you're talking about having 15 years 15 years that's a very long time to be longing for something so when you found out that moment when you found out you were pregnant you must have been my mum was like don't go and tell anyone please keep it a secret just till it's safe and I told her mum I've waited 15 years to be able to shout out from the top of the mountains I'm pregnant I called everybody I knew on that day, <laughs> I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. She's like, you're crazy. I said, I don't care. You know, it's not going to protect me from pain if I lose this baby, not having shared it. Okay, maybe I'll have to, more explaining to do, but 
I'm so happy now. I want to share it with the world. And if I have to deal with loss, this isn't going to, keeping it to myself is not going to make the loss any worse, any easier. So I, I love your your rationale, your thoughts about that. You're like you're celebrating the fact that after today, 15 years, you got pregnant. You and I can call caring. my friends and tell them I'm pregnant. You know, because I I had to be always happy for them, but I had to be on the receiving end of like I'm pregnant. And each time I heard that, although. I'm obviously happy for them. My sadness was not because I didn't want them to have babies. I always felt, when is it going to happen to me? Can I ask you about this? Because this is something that we have touched recently on not just this po podcast, but also the Parallel po Podcast Empowered. And there are an awful lot of things that we don't talk about as women. And there are some women like myself who can't, who literally cannot have children who cannot have children. And there is, we talked to Maxine on Empowered and she had had a miscarriage. And we've talked to Tez on this show who had She's difficulty had okay. uh, giving birth because she had an emergency C-section. And we, we as women, we're not very kind to each other. We don't talk about these things. We don't open up these conversations. But you just mentioned there, seeing other women who getting their families, having their families. And I should imagine by the time that you came to being pregnant... They all and had all teenagers. They had teenagers, right? So I had I to mean, make a whole new... My friends today are all in their 30s, just hitting 40 now. So um, I had to make a whole new set of friends because my friends were ready to go out and start travelling on their own and I couldn't join them because I had a newborn at home, which I was very happy about. Don't, get, don't get me wrong, but... I had to make, it was lonely at first, till I made some new friends. But did you ever feel, and it was something that Maxine said, did you ever feel that not being able to have a child naturally affected you and your confidence as a woman? Um, I just need to swallow the lump in my throat. Because even though it's, I've had a baby and I've... Um, it's like the pain lives in you forever. You never, it never really goes away. It's, it's healed, but it's, um, it still can really come up like when you talk about it, you know? And so I'll take a breath. I used to look at animals. I used to look at cats with babies, with kittens, and I was, I'd be like, even they work, you know? I don't work. Or, um, I, yes. The answer is yes. It destroys you because you just feel you're not a woman. I felt I wasn't a woman. I felt I didn't work as a woman. I felt I, um, I wasn't like, I didn't belong. Did you find, I mean, you, you were a mother, though. You had two children who you had adopted mm -hmm. without wanting to cast any aspersions on ad that adoption is not being a mother because I don't believe that for a second. But did you feel that when you had your own daughter that you had given birth to, that that fulfilled you as a mother in ways that you couldn't have been fulfilled before? Yes, M mainly because I loved pregnancy. I always, even as a kid, would look at a pregnant woman and think, oh my God, I can't wait to be pregnant one day and feel the baby kick. And I just... In my head, pregnancy was really something glorified, you know, and I looked forward to it. And my friends used to tease me. They'd be like, you're going to be the first one of our clicker to have a baby because you're the only really, really maternal one. I was maternal from a little, uh, my dolls and everything. I was a tomboy, but a maternal tomboy. And um, so, yes, I, I longed to be pregnant. I longed to know what it was like to feel um, a baby inside you and to feel it grow and also my kids came to me when they were eight and six and I love babies so I had missed out on the mothering of an infant I was still a mother mother of you know school children but I longed to be the mother of, there's something about having a baby that I don't know I longed for I really yearned for it with every pore of my body so um, and it's really silly, but just before I got pregnant with Lily, I found a cat. Can I talk about this too? <laughs> I found Absolutely. a kitten. Absolutely. I found a kitten on my, my son found a kitten on our doorstep. It was on our doorstep, literally. It was like 
sent from somewhere. And um, it was one day old. It still had its umbilical cord attached to it. And um, we took it to the vet, and his mummy must have dropped him somewhere. And the vet said, he's not going to survive, but you can try and feed him and do all the things his mummy cat would do, like clean his bum because they get constipated. So I was putting olive oil in all the time, rubbing his tummy. I kept him in my top. I took him everywhere with me. And when I traveled to England to do IVF, I had like, I missed it. I mean, it was crazy. I poured all this 15 years of waiting, of yearning for an infant onto this baby cat, baby kitten. And literally, I bottle fed him. I woke up three times a night. It was, but it was a bit too much. It was too much. I mean, I went to therapy. I, I, as a psychotherapist, I have to go to therapy to work, you know, but I worked on it because it was too much. I, se I had separ separation anxiety from my cat. I, when I was pregnant, my doctor put me in hospital for six weeks, even though it was a perfect pregnancy, but he just was worried about me. He just said, this baby is too precious. And David had to bring the cat to the hospital to visit. I used to go into the car park to see my cat. But the cat made it, obviously. Yes, yes, oh, the cat made it. The cat just died a few weeks ago. He oh, was I'm 12. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, so cool. But he made it to he a grand age. He made it. I mean, he... And when Lily came home, he had... Um, he suffered from depression. He lost all his fur, and he, he couldn't deal with the fact that I suddenly had Lily. So it was quite traumatic for him. Good but heavens anyway, above. <laughs> I digressed. No, but I was trying to say, I, yes, it was special because I had a lot of yearning to be the mother of an infant. And that was the only difference. I was a mother, and my mother, my maternal instincts were, my need to be a mother was fulfilled. I loved my mother. I loved being the mother of my two kids. But I still was so grateful to be able to experience being the mother of an infant. Now, you just mentioned being a psychotherapist there. I'm assuming being a psychotherapist helped the situation. It helped you deal with the situation, or does it not work like that? In my, my, I studied to become a psychotherapist. Um, okay, so back to my life. <laughs> After eight years, I, in one of my IVFs, I did get pregnant, but I miscarried twice, to like within three months of each other, and. I think probably they were some of the darkest days of my life because I thought the hard part was getting pregnant. Once I was pregnant, it would be fine. But anyway, it wasn't. And a friend of mine who we, stu we were studying as for the master's together knew how much I liked um, psychotherapy and uh, psych psychology. And she asked me if I would... She was asked to do these life skills things for university students, and she couldn't. So she said, why don't you go? And anyway, I started doing them. And I was hanging out with all these psychologists, psychotherapists, and I felt I belonged. I loved it. We'd sit in the refectory and be listening to them talk about their clinics. And, and it was just like, OK, this is me. This is who I want to be. This is where I belong. And I started studying psychotherapy at that point when I was just about to adopt. and. Um, I was dealing with the miscarriage as well. So to be a psychotherapist, you have to do like 200 hours as the client. So it helped. Yes, it did help me. Wow. <laughs> it helped me. Um, it helped me heal a lot of stuff. I spent, we all spent a lot of time crying in those training, in those training hours. But my tears were mainly to do with, with this. Karen, just talking to you now, I mean, you, you've touched on, as far as families go, you've touched on everything. You've touched on miscarriage, infertility, adoption, a late pregnancy and parenthood. Okay. Because you were in your 40s and now you're 53 and you still have a young one. I have a 10-year-old and I have to say it was easier being a mother of a 10-year-old in my 30s than in my 50s. <laughs> <laughs> she gets away with so much more because I don't have the energy I did. I was really strict. My, ki my, old, my, old, my adult kids now tell me, you know, sh we never would have got away with that. You were so strict to us. You were so mean. But I had so much more energy. I could 
Karen, you were just explaining my childhood because I had an older brother and then who was only three years older than me. I had a younger brother who was seven years younger than me. He got away with anything he wanted. That's because your mum had no energy for, for him. Seriously. Now I'm seeing the whole thing different. And Seriously. now I'm going to say he wasn't just the, the, the favourite child. Mum could not be bothered to tell him off. That... Seriously, I don't have the energy. I don't have the patience. I, I, it's easier to say, do what you want. And it's really bad. And I know that it's wrong. And I need to have more boundaries with her because she's getting to the point where she's having a bit of attitude. And so I, need, I must be stricter. And I'm aware of it. And I'm working on it. But it's tiring. I, 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 the next, uh, one of the other topics we kind of briefly talked about is menopause. That doesn't help. Being a well, menopausal mum of a 10-year-old <laughs> is not a good idea. I mean, seriously, Karen, you've been through everything. But you just, we, we did talk about menopause before uh, we started with this. And let, let's touch on menopause for a second, because, again, you've just mentioned now that you are, or I've mentioned that you're 53. You are also... Soon to be 53. Okay. Let but I, I've started again. saying I'm 53, so I get used to it. I, I've been doing that about being 50 about two years ago, and I'm just preparing myself for the big 5-0. But you look so much younger than, than you are. You are incredibly active. But there is this thing that happens at around our age, and it's called the menopause. And it's, one again, one of those things that women do not talk about. I'm just opening these conversations now with women and asking about menopause. It's one of those conditions that surprises me because every single woman in the world is going to be affected in one way or another by a change that will be related to their menopause. And yet... If you ask a woman, what is it? How long does it last? What, what did you experience? Everybody is in a cloud of... Because menopause brain really exists. We are in a cloud. Seriously, she... you forget everything. You, uh, okay. Okay, so you are now a, a mum of a 10-year-old. Not only are you a mum of a 10-year-old, but you also have your business and you're also extremely active. And we'll come to that in a minute as well. But how has the menopause affected you as a woman, but also a woman who is a mother of a 10-year-old? You just said brain fog. I'm a person who takes things in my stride. I don't make a big deal. I have coped with stuff that, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not dramatic. I, I'll do it. I'll get on with it. And I always used to think menopause was going to be like that. Wrong. Seriously? I suffered. I really had a hard time. Have a hard time. It, I, was, I used to be, oh, how can it be such a big deal, you know? Deal with it. You, you deal with it. But Okay, okay. This is a big Can I, I ask really you a couple suffered. of questions? When did you start? I think perimenopause, the, the time before your period actually stops. Menopause is when your period has stopped for a year. Oh, oh, wow. See, I didn't even know that. Okay, okay. this is that great. That is menopause. Okay. So the time before the body preparing for that is called perimenopause. And I think I was around 46, 47. Okay. But it was quite mild. I'd just get the occasional hot flush. Um, my periods started playing around. Um, they were closer to each other and then three months nothing. And then anyway, so... Um, but nothing more than that. And I thought... It's okay. People make a fuss. Then the hot flushes started to get worse. And um, brain fog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. Then I think they stopped at, my period stopped at 49.50 was the time it just stopped completely. I had every single symptom. I went to my doctor a year and a half ago, and he said, okay, he got out the list of menopause symptoms, and I ticked off every single one except one of them, which I then I'll, I'll mention, but um, like joint pain, fatigue, not sleeping at night, like being wide awake at two in the morning. You, you go to sleep, you're exhausted, but then you wake up with a hot flush, and then you can't sleep again. So I was tired from not sleeping, tired from the menopause, the hormones, crazy, angry, 
<laughs> your face. Sorry, my face. Can you see my face? Your face. I'm like, <laughs> oh my word! But you're also tired because you have a a, a ten year a ten year old who seriously brushing her hair and she just moves slightly. I just want to grab her and. Horror. And, and I've always been a pretty calm person. No, you're one of the sweetest Stop. people I know. No, but, no, I didn't. I stopped being that. I hate. I didn't like myself. And what was also terrible was the hot flushes preceding each hot flush. I would know a hot flush is coming because I'd get a panic attack. And I never suffered from panic attacks. But suddenly my heart would begin to race. I'd feel my heart on the ground and I'd feel like I can't breathe. And it was honestly terrible. And anger, sadness, irrationality. You know that you're being stupid and irrational, but you can't control yourself because you want to kill somebody. But you are talking about this as if it's in the past tense. Because I went to my doctor and he told me, you know you don't have to live this way. You know life can be worth living. And I was like, what do I need to do? And he said, HRT. And I was completely against HRT, I thought, because I thought it was um, dangerous. I thought it increased risks of... um, cancers but yeah, yeah. he explained stuff to me. he told me that was hrt in the past he said hrt today is so different and he said i'll just give you a really slow um small dose just to alleviate the symptoms but not high enough estrogen that puts you at risk but enough estrogen to um take away the hot flushes it will only be it you'll have to put up with it for five more days but then you'll be better Oh, my God, it gave me my life back. And apart from the fact that it reduces the risks of other things like other cancers when and heart disease when you take, I think, heart disease. I'm not sure if heart disease is one of them. But um, when you take HRT, it, osteoporosis and all that. So, you know, the benefits far outweigh the costs. And if that little percentage of um, risk is worth living, you know, I'm living today. I you see, Karen, it's also, you know, you, you scared the crap <laughs> you scared the crap out of me a second ago with you saying, yes, I got really, really angry because I'm just looking at Karen Trans and going, she's not angry. <laughs> I mean, yes, it must be worthwhile. But coming back again to what, to what we were saying before and relating to every topic that I've talked to women about, whether it be, whether it be miscarriage, I mean, just the things that we've mentioned now, miscarriage, adoption, um, infertility, and now menopause, why don't we talk about this? Because also one of the symptoms that come across, I've come across when I've asked women about it recently, is bad gut bacteria, which can last for months and months and months and be very uncomfortable and very uh, very distressing. And it's only been recently identified as one of the symptoms of menopause. Why? Because women have been having menopause for millennia. And yet now we're saying, okay, this could be, and this could be, and this could be, and this is what happens when your estrogen levels drop Drop. and your testosterone levels get affected as well. So, I mean, I'm always very confused and and sort of dumbfounded as to why we as women don't talk about these things more often. You think it's shame or...? or Maybe it's it's the need to always um, be perfect the social media and that glorifies perfection and you know there's like standards that are so high in having a perfect life and living perfect lifestyles and maybe there is shame because shame or guilt shame as well comes um is the experience is the emotion related to when you are not living up to your own internal standards or intern or standards created by society when you don't when the the discrepancy between societal or internal standards and actual creates shame creates guilt so you took your hrt uh-huh. And you got Karen back. Yes. And I'm assuming that the <laughs> that the hot flushes have minimised. I, so I will be getting once woman. a week. <laughs> once a week. Oh wow. Maybe you know. And he said I can up your dose a little bit if they come back. I just get a little bit sweaty sometimes, but no big deal. Oh, sorry. I get this, sweaty when I'm shy this, too. So <laughs> this face was a face of fear because we're all women. No, we're all going to go through but it. But there's a solution. I, I love the fact that you've identified a solution because I know that again, a lot of 
women that I'm talking to about this topic at the moment are seeing that there just isn't a way out. It's, it's actually quite scary. And a lot of women still do uh, identify with the stigma of HRT being dangerous and, and um, having all the implications of cancer and so on and so forth. So just hearing you say that is extremely helpful. My doctor reassured me and reassured me. And part of the um, Six Pack Revolution coaching team, there's a doctor on board and she's always, I, I ask her, you know, advice and she's like, I always tell my patients, go for HRT. The, the benefits far outweigh the risks. Well, see, now you nicely segued into the conversation yeah. about SPR, which is Six Pack Revolution. And so we're going to finish up with talking about this because there is Karen Schranz, who's had this incredible life of experience of joy and of sadness, of challenges and healing and hurt and giving and receiving and love and all these sorts of things, but definitely not the easiest path. And then you find yourself a, a mother of 43, of a, of a newborn that you've longed for for 15 years. And then I'm estimating somewhere around maybe three years ago, maybe a little bit more, you decide to take on Six Pack Revolution, which leads me to the question of, Karen, did you not just have enough to cope with? How, why Six Pack Revolution? I know that you love fitness and physical, but what was the motivation to get involved with a, a year in, year out activity to help people get fit and, and get I love psychotherapy. I love um, supporting people and um, helping people. Uh, that sounds like, uh, you know what I mean. But um, <laughs> I love fitness. And it was like a perfect meeting of the two because you can't really separate the emotional from the physical. A lot of people who are in um, struggling with weight, there's an emotional factor to that too. You know, they emotion, there's emotional eating, overeating. And um, so helping people with identifying the emotional side of their habits and then the fitness with it is like a meeting of my two passions but i i'm not the face actually the founder of six pack revolution water mel de mayo is because she was um my daughter's teacher and we used to train together we made friends when she was her teacher and she was the first person in malta to do the six pack revolution because she have an english friend of hers had done it she saw her results and she decided she was going to try it and I always trained but I actually had a six-pack and I thought you know I'm approaching 50 I was 40 nearly 49 at the point at that time and I said you know my present to myself for my 50th birthday is to have a six-pack even though I was strong and I was fit but I never ate the way you need to eat to be lean I was always a bit of a big booty and big not, I wasn't, didn't have a big tummy, but I had a big bum. I've had a big bum all my life. Karen, I, you know, you've, you've amazed me. You have absolutely amazed me. And I know that we're going to talk again. And I want to thank you for being so unbelievably open about your experiences. I have newfound respect for you. I'm really glad for the HRT because now I'm not so scared you of you. <laughs> uh, but I'm really grateful for you being on can the Can I interview. give you another good cure for the... Irish, irrational anger that you might feel, battle ropes. Battle ropes, there you go. You hit it first. <laughs> Whack them out of battle ropes. Oh, my goodness. And get all your frustration Slamming. out. It's better than taking it out on the husband. Oh, well, yes, I would say it probably is. Karen, thank you so much for being on the interview. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure and um, I've loved every minute. For those willing to change the world one step at a time. For those dreaming of sustainable living. For those striving to find a healthier balance. For those always believing. Browns and Viridian. Love the planet, love yourself.